You're watching Script Tease. In today's episode, we'll be finishing our discussion on the power of names. We'll be looking at a wide variety of different media. Names may be a key signifier we use to identify ourselves, but most of the time names are used by other people to identify us. When other people use our names and what form of our name they use says a lot about how that person perceives us or what message they're trying to convey. Of course, this is true in real life, but we can apply the same logic to dialogue in scripts. Seeing how characters use names, morph names, or ignore names entirely tells us about their personality and their opinion of the person they're addressing. The most obvious time someone uses our name is when they're trying to get our attention. This could be for a positive reason, like when a colleague asks for your input on a project or a friend wants your opinion. Alternatively, it could be for a negative reason, like when your mum wants you to help around the house or your teacher is trying to get you to listen up. In any of these cases though, one fact remains constant. The person using your name is not only trying to get your attention, they're also focusing their attention on you. And that means when someone uses someone else's name, they have to care about them at least to some degree. Look at this example from Whiplash, where student drummer Andrew was amazed that his hard-ass music teacher Fletcher actually bothered to remember his name. This note is important, as it reminds us even when Fletcher is at his most psychotically abusive, that in his own twisted way, he does care about his students. The opposite situation would therefore imply that you don't care about the person. If you don't know someone's name, you probably don't really care about them. They're forgettable. Have you ever had that experience of meeting someone, asking their name, but not really listening when they give it to you? And then 15 minutes into the conversation, you find yourself hitting it off and you realize you have no idea what their name is, so you have to ask again? That second time you ask their name is when you've actually decided you care enough to remember it. Salesmen, teachers, and bosses all develop the ability to remember names on the spot so they can establish that they care about their customers, students, and employees. Now, I get that all of this might seem fairly obvious, but it's amazing how quickly common social norms fly out the window when we sit down to write scripts. The number one bad dialogue habit of new screenwriters is overusing names. Try reading this out loud. Hey Jess, wanna get lunch? Sure Jake, what do you wanna eat? How about sushi, Jess? I'd rather not, Jake. I had sushi last night with Jeremy, Harry, and Luke. Now, apart from being the most boring piece of drivel that I've ever had the displeasure of reciting, this dialogue is just grossly laden with names. The only name that really should be in there is the first mention, Hey Jess, since it's presumably getting Jess's attention. Even then, it's probably obvious from the context that Jake is addressing Jess, and so her name is unnecessary. So how do we organically mention character names in our stories? Typically, group settings are your best bet. You're more likely to hear names in classrooms, offices, and bars, since people are constantly trying to single out specific people that they're addressing. Barry, get over here! Phone calls are another great method, since we'll often use someone's name when they first answer the phone. When we're calling someone we don't know personally, we'll also likely introduce ourselves and provide the reason why we're calling. The other time we use people's names is when we're not addressing them at all, but speaking about them. This could be when the person is present, where saying the person's name is considered more polite than saying he or she. Hence the saying, she is the cat's mother. If the person isn't present, but it's not entirely clear who we're talking about, we might still use their name for clarity. Famous individuals are probably the best example of this, where gossip mags and newspaper reports use their names. This could include celebrities, politicians, and criminals, or any mix of the three. Lastly, we might learn someone's name through text rather than in dialogue. It could be a close-up of a name badge, a headline in the newspaper, or a profile in a database. These different methods can also tell us a lot about the character. A name badge could be a nervous guy at a speed dating event. A headline in the newspaper could be a superhero who just saved the city. And a profile in a database could be a criminal at large. There are far too many ways that a character's name could be mentioned in a story, but the key rule is to make it organic. Don't just put someone's name in dialogue because you want the audience to know their name as early as possible. And also, have fun with it. Try to think up unique, creative ways to slip your character's name into the story. You know, using your imagination. It's that fun thing that makes us want to be writers in the first place. To me, the most interesting part of names is the various forms they take on when we know someone well enough. Pets are a great example of this. We use their names so often and in so many different tones that we adopt a range of silly nicknames for them. When I was growing up, my dog's name was Gizmo. This became Giz, The Giz, Gizzy, 
Gizzy Boy, Gizzy Bo, Gizzy Bo Bo, Gizzy Bo Bo, and if I was feeling particularly rambunctious, Gizmaster 9000. Of course, if he pooed on the floor, then I would immediately refer back to the stock standard Gizmo. My point here is, the version of his name that I would use depended not only upon my permanent affection for him, but also on the particular mood I was in at the time, or what I wanted from him. In this way, names can tell us how we feel about someone. One of the best examples of this philosophy is Batman. How different characters refer to Batman tells us a lot about their relationship with him. Of course, people who know him personally use variations on his real name. Lucius calls him Mr. Wayne, Alfred calls him Master Wayne, and Rachel calls him Bruce. But when Bruce adopts the persona of Batman, there are two main options used by thugs, cops, and the general public. Batman, or THE Batman. Typically, and I would be lying if I said this was always the case, but typically, people use Batman when they view him as more human, but THE Batman when they view him as an icon. For example, in the Dark Knight trilogy, he's called Batman by Rachel, Alfred, and even a kid. On the other hand, he's called THE Batman by Dr. Crane and the cops. Keep in mind that most cops see the Batman as a vigilante, not as a hero. Of course, the character that bucks this trend, in other Batman-related media at least, is the Joker. He likes to use pet names for Batman in a mocking, friendly way, like The Bat, Bats, Batsy, or even Batsy Watsy. These pet-like nicknames are perfect, as they show how insane the Joker really is, how he doesn't appear to take Batman seriously at all, and the odd dependence he has on Batman's existence. In particular, how we vary someone's name can demonstrate our level of respect. Titles are a great way to show respect. They're a form of etiquette that's built into our language. Not using someone's title, or using the incorrect title, demonstrates either rebellion or ignorance. For example, if your teacher's name is Bradley Dinkeldorf, then you're most likely meant to call him Mr. Dinkeldorf, or, depending on his degree, Professor Dinkeldorf. Therefore, if you just call him Dinkeldorf, or Dinkle, or Dinklewinkle, he'll probably be none too pleased. But of course, this depends not only on the speaker's intent, but also on the receiver's reaction. Maybe Bradley Dinkeldorf loves these nicknames, and they make him feel closer to his students. Or maybe he hates Dinklewinkle, but loves Brad, or Dorf, or the Dorfinator. For another example, let's head to Japan, where we have an entirely different set of honorifics. Sensei is an honorific used for teachers or people that have mastered a skill, so it's certainly a term of respect. The honorific suffix chan is more cutesy, generally used between girls, children, or for pets and other cute things. While these honorifics have intended meanings, they also can be played with for comic effect or to make a point. For example, the honorific suffix nisan is conventionally used when referring to one's older sibling. However, it's frequently used in smutty Japanese media as a sexual term, kind of jokingly used in a teasing, provocative way. Don't, uh, don't ask me why I know that. My point is, when Nissan is used in a different context other than its intended use, it takes on an alternate meaning. Kind of like if you called your boyfriend Master, everyone would understand from context that he doesn't literally own you, but instead that you're just into that freaky deaky business. Why does this keep circling around to dirty topics? What name we refer to someone by, whether we refer to them by their title, and how they react to the name and title you call them by, demonstrates your relationship. As with when to use names, the different forms of names have so many possibilities that I can't possibly describe them all here. Think about what your friends call you versus what a colleague calls you. Think about what your parents call you casually versus what they call you when they're mad. Think about what the warden calls you versus what the other inmates call you. Shout out to my viewers in prison. You guys have a lot of time to write stuff. There is one more way we can use names in scripts. We can imbue names with special meanings, using the audience's meta-knowledge of names and naming conventions to hide little easter eggs and references to other characters and people. Try as I might, there's really no way for me to explain this idea without just using some examples. Hal, the rebellious onboard computer from 2001 A Space Odyssey, takes his name by moving each letter back by one in the name IBM. Kira, Light Yagami's alternate persona from Death Note, is a transliteration of the English word killer. The Babadook is a riff on the Serbian name for the boogeyman, which is called Babaroga. You may wonder what the point of this is, and the answer is that there really isn't one. Except that it's cool, and it helps generate names. And quite frankly, if you're not down with that, then what's wrong with you? Okay, now that we've gone through how names sound, what names can tell us, how we use names, what forms of names we use, and the special meanings behind names, 
let's put all of our innate naming skills to the test. I'm going to come up with some names. Everyone watching, think of what type of character you reckon the name belongs to. Then I'll say how I pictured the character and why. If our ideas match, then it'll be like a cross-internet fist bump. Let's do it. General Frank Argyle. Pause the video now. I picture General Frank Argyle as a general, duh, in the American military sometime in the early to mid 20th century. I picture him as quite a stern, rough character, a no-nonsense kind of man. But I also think he's good at what he does, that he believes in his country's cause, and his blunt nature is a result of his determination to complete his mission. The title of general here does most of the hard work for us, implying he's in some kind of army. The name Frank sounds stereotypically American to me, and also suggests that he would have been born around the turn of the century. Also note that his name is Frank, instead of Francis, which sounds more posh, Frankie, which sounds more childlike, or Franciscus, which would suggest a far older time period. I also don't know any women named Frank, so his gender is easy enough to peg down. The name Argol sounds strong to me, maybe because it sounds kind of like Argol. Taken together with the name Frank, it also seems like a man who takes himself quite seriously. The part about him being good at his job and devoted to the cause honestly just came about because I could picture him staring at the approaching army with a steely gaze before shouting at his men to get their asses into gear. Yeah, I guess my imagination ran away with me a little. He'd probably be played by J.K. Simmons, that's all I'm saying. Okay, next one. Mistress Catherine Carter. Pause the video now. I picture a boarding school teacher in England about the mid-19th century. I can imagine her hair up in a bun, glasses on, trying to look the part, but still quite young, maybe in her late 20s. I think she would be an intellectual type, as befits her role. However, because she's still young, she's not a great disciplinarian. Her success as a teacher comes from her boundless curiosity rather than her expertise. Now with this one, you could go a couple of different ways with the word mistress, depending on your specific proclivities, but personally, I thought I'd stick with the school idea. The alliteration in the name seems kind of sing-songy to me, and that definitely makes me think British. It's Catherine rather than the more modern Kate, which suggests to me that she's more upper class and or from an older time period. I still imagine though that her friends might call her Kate outside of work. As with General Frank Argyle, as I built the physical image from her name, the personality just came to me, trying to imbue her with strengths and flaws that befit her role as an educator. Okay, so you get the idea. Try generating some names of your own and see where your imagination takes you. What do they look like? What do they do? What are they good at? What are their weaknesses? The more you play with this idea, the clearer the image you'll have of how your imagination works. For extra fun, try creating a set of names that could all exist in the same world together. That way, you have a format in which to express your different characters. As an example, I'll try doing it using some formats from stories that already exist to demonstrate what I mean. And you guys can try and guess what world they're from. Yegros Bone Crusher, World of Warcraft, Cotton Dream Twinkle, My Little Pony, Gabrolio, literally any Shakespearean play, Willy Gig, Moomin, Shamadamawat, Cats, Millicent Rookwood, Harry Potter, Magenta Ranger, Power Rangers, Officer Magenta, Cluedo, Reginald Magenta, Black Butler. Mr. Magenta, Reservoir Dogs. Magenta, Blue's Clues. Oh wait, that one, uh, that one already exists. Okay, okay, that's enough. I mainly just did that to show off my awesome name generating skills. As you can see though, there are so many different types of names out there, and some of them, if not all of them, seem truly nonsensical. I hate to say this after you just watched two whole videos on the topic, but the name you give a character doesn't matter if you don't have a good character to begin with. A great name doesn't fix a bad character, and an awful name doesn't ruin a good character. Just think of Winnie the Pooh. It's a gross, absurd name, but one of the most popular characters around the world. Great characters create new associations. As the audience grows to love the character, that character's name passes into the annals of memorable names and goes on to shape future works. So yeah, have fun coming up with a name that you reckon best suits your character and your world. But more importantly, come up with such an amazing character that people want to say their name. Good writing and good luck.